Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets, and I'm your host, Dr. Judy. You can listen to my show, Naturally Healthy Pets, on DreamVision7Radio.com every Monday and Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. I'm really excited today to have a guest that I've had on my show before, Dr. Peter Tobias, who hails from a few different areas. I'm pretty sure he's in Hawaii right now, and I'm really jealous because I'm sitting in New Jersey and it's ridiculously cold, and he just showed me a picture with palm trees out the window. That's pretty unfair. But he also spent some of his time in Europe and in Canada. Peter, welcome aboard. Hi, Judy. Hi. I'm so excited to be here, actually. I was looking forward to being here together and I couldn't almost sleep and uh, just to kind of uh, give you peace of mind I'm actually leaving Hawaii and I'm going to the cold of the Czech Republic so we're gonna be on the same level so it's all good and <laughs> plus the other thing is that we never appreciate what we have and we always look elsewhere but you know tropics have bugs and cockroaches and centipedes and uh, and too much rain and too much mud and too much sun and all that so Grass is always greener on the other side, right? That's true, but I don't think I could have too much sun. I'm a sun worshiper. I absolutely love heat and warmth, especially the older I get, the more I love it. So which island are you on? I'm on Maui, and I'm on the north shore of Maui, which is kind of a hippie granola area where there's healthy food and food trucks. The most fancy clothing is basically board shorts and t-shirt. And so I, I kind of go back to nature here, and it always reminds me how much I want to connect medicine and healing with nature and how little there is to invent because there's so much in medicine that is already invented when it comes to healing. That is and true. It's, it is around us all the time and we walk right by it and ignore it. And I was in Maui uh, in August and it is beautiful, I will say. Oh, nice, nice, nice. It's an island that has uh, very much diversity. You know, you can be in the tropics and then you go up the mountain and you're, you're freezing virtually. Just about uh, two days ago, I biked up the mountain, up the volcano, it's 10,000 feet. And it was freezing and rain and fog and cold. And it actually yeah, tells it's us. It's kind of amazing. We went up there for the sunrise at, you know, five o'clock in the morning. It was 30 degrees up there. And I thought, I did not pack for the winter when I came to Hawaii, but it was worth it. And I cannot believe you rode your bike up there. I, I wasn't even comfortable taking a bus up there. <laughs> I'm a little crazy, but that's okay. I, you know, that's how I keep myself uh, healthy. I guess the brain needs blood circulation. If I come to these interviews, I have to have functional brain. So uh, I have to bike up the mountain. <laughs> Holy cow. And, and then are you one of those crazy people who rides down the mountain with your arms and legs sticking out in all directions? You know, I, I got a ride this time. And it was really funny because I have visitors here. I had my 80 year old friend who we brought over for her birthday and uh, she went up uh, with her friend. And by the time I got up on my bike, um, one of the friends was lost. She was actually lost in the car. They were kind of looking for each other. So it was very funny. And I, I couldn't really bike down because it was too dark for her. So I just basically drove them down. But sometimes I go down and it's not as nice as going uphill, which is kind of crazy. But you know, it can be cold, it can be foggy and rainy. And uh, yeah, I, I like the uphill. I don't know. I, I think uphill is a good direction, <laughs> even in life, right? Uphill is well, a good direction. The downhill looks extremely life. dangerous. So I think that uphill would be better, but I think I, I would, you know, make it about 20 feet and then say, yeah, I'm done with that. So, <laughs> so all right, we, we need to give our listeners a little bit of education here. And one of the things that you and I were talking about right before we came on air I said I wanted to talk about gut health because it is so important to the overall health for ourselves and for our pets. And uh, so you said you have this discovery that actually has to do with exercise and gut health. So obviously biking up a mountain is one form of exercise. So give me your take on the best way to achieve good gut health for our pets. I mean, we're pretty familiar with the fact that we need to have more good bacteria than bad bacteria. We have to have a balance with everything and we have to have, you know, probiotics and prebiotics. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, diet is one part of it. But you say that you have made some other discoveries with other things that play into that. You know, I have to disclose here, we haven't prepared for this conversation, so it's going to be totally off the cuff. And uh, I'm going to do my best to explain it as clearly as possible. And there is always a story to every discovery or every everything that we learn. 
a newly. This was my dog, Sky, when he was little and I got him and he was about three or four months. Obviously, I was like everyone else trying to do my best to make him happy and well exercised and well fed and all that. So I would take him to the park and I would chuck a ball with that chuck it tool. And uh, after a few weeks, he started having diarrhea. And, you know, first I used the holistic treatment and approaches and IV fluids and also homeopathic remedies and he would get better and then he would get worse again. And uh, I got to a point where I was really scared to actually see him having diarrhea for days and almost weeks. So I kind of went back to the drawing board and thinking, okay, so what, what am I doing differently? And um, I started studying some Chinese medicine graphs and charts and uh, looking at the connection of the lumbar area with, with the gut. I went, oh my God, like maybe he's got actually tight muscles in the lumbar area and those muscles impinge the nerves and the blood vessels. And as a result, the gut is not functioning properly. So I stopped exercising him, I started taking him on walks and I, I was you know, jogging with him, but nothing intense, nothing, no sprinting. And he stopped having diarrhea. So then I started testing it with other dogs that were running and, and high intensity exercise and also examining the back, realizing that a lot of dogs have lumbar injuries, muscle tightness, they have misalignments of the vertebrae. And obviously the nerve lines and the blood, blood flow to the gut comes from there. So. I started kind of thinking about it as if the dog has a watering system. Imagine a garden, there's a watering system and that the main pipe is the spine. And then the branches of the watering system go to the different organs and the lumbar branches go to the gut. And when you start actually looking at gut health and people treat their dogs for allergies, they quite often forget or they don't know that lumbar area is super important. So I would say that at least half of the dogs that come back with diarrhea or come to practice with diarrhea actually don't have any primary allergies or diet related issues. They actually have issues with the lumbar spine. So I obviously have been using this in practice for many, many years and uh, chronic diarrhea basically stopped existing in my practice. So I was really excited. And then he get to the next phase and you try to kind of convey it to your colleagues and you try to communicate this message to others and people go, well, wait a minute, like, you know, my dog has diarrhea, it must be diet, it must be probiotics, it must be all that. And there is no way that this could be related to lumbar. So I've written some articles and anyone who wants to read them, they're on my website, but it's still, I think that we still need to acknowledge the ancient knowledge of Chinese traditional medicine that lumbar area relates to gut. And you're a Chinese medicine practitioner more than me because, you know, I'm kind of using this bit from Chinese medicine and it works well. But it is kind of fascinating that sometimes in the process of trying to figure certain conditions out, we are actually forgetting about the simple treatments and simple solutions and look for some sort of complexity and, you know, often Dogs end up on steroids, they end up um, on different medication and special diets. Their health is kind of ruined in the process of treatment. While all they need to do sometimes, in some cases, is to adjust exercise, hire a chiropractor, massage their dog's lumbar, maybe do some acupuncture and the diarrhea will solve. It makes so much sense if you think about it. You know, if a dog is going to come to me with digestive problems, I mean, if it's got diarrhea, then we're going to treat, you know, bladder 25, bladder 26, which are basically in the lower lumbar area because that's what goes to the large intestine, the small intestine, and that's what we're treating. And, you know, at the thoracolumbar junction, that's where we're treating spleen and, and stomach function, which is the digestive function from a Chinese medicine standpoint. So really, it makes perfect sense. And I do chiropractic as well as acupuncture. And every time I use the two things together, I find that where I get the reactions with the chiropractic exactly match the hot acupuncture points that need to be treated. So it is very true that these animals that have chronic issues are not getting good nerve function, not getting good blood flow to that area. So really it makes perfect sense. And, you know, as much as I do acupuncture on these animals and I do chiropractic on these animals, it's not always the first thing I reach for when I've got a chronic diarrhea case. So 
that's a great, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just don't put two and two together. <laughs> it is so much fun when a dog walks in the practice and his guardian says, my dog has diarrhea, it's headed for, I don't know, two years or three years, and he examines the dog and he, you just kind of start dealing with the bits and pieces that are out of alignment and suddenly a week or two weeks later, everything is done, right? Everything is gone. You know, I think we have to talk more about this topic and maybe, maybe just kind of do a whole, you know, it doesn't sound very appealing, but maybe we should do a diarrhea course or something. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think it is a really common uh, problem. And, you know, unfortunately, what I see is that people will have, you know, saliva testing or allergy testing done. And, you know, then they'll set up a consultation with me and say, okay, I got these results back and my dog is allergic to all proteins. I'm sorry, but that just, I mean, they're dogs, they're, they're meant to eat, well, or cats, but mostly we deal with it with dogs, but they're meant to eat meat, they're meant to, meant to eat protein, and there's no way that you can tell me that hundreds of thousands of dogs out there are allergic to every animal protein, and I find people going crazy trying to find emu and ostrich and kangaroo and alligator and just incredibly weird proteins and you know they'll feed one for a while and the, then the diarrhea comes right back and so then they go to something else and the diarrhea comes right back and I get the complaint of well my dog just can't eat any meat my dog can't eat any protein but they're not going to do any better on a vegetarian diet which I'm not a fan of anyway but they're not going to do any better on that they, they can't have a complete protein allergy there's other things that aren't being addressed and you know it very well may be that it's a chiropractic issue or something else that needs to be addressed so you know unfortunately a lot of times we're looking for the or the clients are looking for the quick fix or the pill and you know my dog's had diarrhea for a year I'm done I want it done today and uh, you know what what's the, the quick fix for it but uh, I, I think this is an interesting uh, an interesting way to go at it I kind of like it <laughs> you know, I like your, I, I like the alignment, right? Like when we start talking and you're saying, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm seeing it from a little different point of view and it still jives, like that's when you actually start seeing medical progress. And um, can we talk a little bit about allergies and diet? Is it okay? Oh yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, obviously there are some dogs that may be hypersensitive to protein and sure. people start eliminating all the different proteins and it becomes very frustrating because at the end there is nothing to feed, right? I see it being very similar to human allergies, let's say hay fever. You can't really eliminate all the grass from the environment, right? So you have to actually look one step back and see like, why is the immune system actually responding or reacting in an exaggerated way? And I always compare it to an office worker who is really overloaded, has too much work to do. And then, you know, one day it starts flipping out. Uh, basically overwork state results in either overreactivity or underreactivity. In my mind, if the body is out of tune, out of alignment, energetically, nutritionally, uh, health-wise, it either underreacts and it allows, let's say, cancer cells to harbor in the body or it overreacts and it starts being allergic to things that and items that and food items that should not be reactive or they, they're not allergens to start with right so this is when the body kind of goes into a little bit of an unhealthy state and allergies are in a way disease of the immune system so you don't necessarily treat the gut by removing the proteins or you don't treat the hay fever by removing grass from the environment you have to actually look further why the immune system is actually overreacting and quite often it is a result of um, Toxicity, excess stress, nutritional deficiencies, obviously poor diet, all that kind of piles up. Sometimes vaccines, right? Uh, excessive vaccines. I'm not against vaccines in certain instances, but I think that we have gone way too far and it shows. Yeah, there are so many different ways of approaching a medical condition, especially diarrhea and allergies, than just kind of eliminating the protein sources. Oh, I agree. I agree. You know, there's so much that goes into it, you know, whether it's vaccines or chemicals or drugs that are causing the immune system to go a little crazy. So since we're talking about diarrhea and gut, 
Have you done much investigation or used the uh, microbiome restoration and fecal transplants? You know, fecal transplants, interesting. I've always been very curious about it and I think that it definitely makes sense. I have been even playing with the idea that we should go to these ancient areas where canines live in packs and, and there's probably the right microbiome on the ground and collecting and uh, creating probiotics. You know, but when it comes to fecal implants, I truly believe in it. I think that practically it may carry some challenges. I do believe that dogs are different than humans. Therefore, if you're starting to give, let's say, probiotics, you have to give canine-specific flora as opposed to giving human flora because it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Have you done any fecal transplants yourself? Or have I you have been... not. And, you know, talking to people who are doing them, and they are becoming a lot more mainstream. And it's interesting because when you look up articles on it, they're doing it in the human field a lot and, uh, you know, showing great benefit. And, you know, it doesn't seem to be that difficult to do. I have not dabbled in that yet. Probably going to have to do it. <laughs> or we'll let someone else to do it. <laughs> it belongs to the same category as anal gland cleaning, you know, expression, <laughs> excusing. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's not exactly, it's not exactly... Yeah, a favorite part of the job, is it? But you know, I love animals and my dream was to go to Africa. So one day we kind of decided to plan the trip with my mother who turned 80 and we took her. Interestingly enough, I was so aware how much dust and everything we are ingesting in Serengeti. And actually my digestion was the best ever. And I was thinking, you know, isn't it how we are supposed to live like in just the dust and obviously there's bacteria in it uh, from the animals and all that but it's probably the healthiest flora on the whole planet i think and that's maybe that's where we should go like it's a little bit of uh, serengeti dust in a in a jar instead of robotics you know <laughs> <laughs> okay well you need to bring your serengeti dust home with you <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm not planning to go again anytime soon but maybe we'll ask someone who is going how about that <laughs> Well, I've never been there, so. <laughs> so, all right, so you travel between all these different countries, like literally between Europe and then Canada and Hawaii. And obviously the food is going to be a little different from place to place to place. Does it wreak havoc with the GI system, changing diets between different places? You know, you're pointing to my travel. I just want to make it clear first. Uh, I have been very lucky to find a credit card that collects points. And so every time I fly, I fly in points because I have obviously I have business and we have a lot of expenses. So the, the expenses go on the credit card and then I fly. But going back to the digestion, it is absolutely true that change of the environment can create havoc. Uh, I must confess that there were some times when uh, it wasn't very pleasant but I discovered that, and, and this is not to indicate, this is not to apply to dogs, but I discovered that drinking green tea when you're traveling is actually really good. Then the other thing, and that applies to dogs, you can actually have chlorophyll capsules and you can also have a good probiotic that you will give your dog if you're traveling to different regions, right? Some people take their dogs from the US or Canada to Mexico. So it is super important for us to give them probiotics, maybe chlorophyll complex. I also like to add some apple cider vinegar that works really well for digestion and just kind of balancing the flora. And uh, yeah, that's my, that's my recipe. Huh. Do you find with agility dogs, because agility is extremely popular, lure coursing is very popular. Uh, do you find a lot of gut health problems with those dogs be because they're overworked or do you think that those owners are pretty good about, you know, keeping it in short sprints? You know, in the past, I haven't really worked specifically with any particular group like agility people, like I had a mixed group of clients. So I can't really say that it's specific, but I would say if you have an agility dog, agility dogs love to, obviously, they love to work, they love to connect. And I think that it's a lot of fun, but you really have to be uh, mindful of their health and in their of their skeletal health and make sure that you work with a chiropractor massage therapist that they don't get weak in the core and especially when they get middle-aged and older 
you have to start working on balancing cushions and balancing boards with them. And my a very good friend, Dr. Kathleen Lavoie, is a chiropractor in Quebec and Ontario, and, and she does an amazing job with agility dogs. So maybe we should bring her in the equation and ask her that question, whether agility dogs have more diarrhea than others. Interesting. Yeah, I just got an email uh, about an hour ago from a client whose dog just turned 13 and he's a border collie. Three years and four months ago he had osteosarcoma of his rib cage. She had the offending ribs removed and he went through I think chemo and radiation but at the age of 12 he qualified for agility at Westminster and ran there in the Masters and she said in the past year so he's just turning 13 he qualified for 28 titles something whatever it is that agility dogs do but he's just an amazing story and the owner is just an amazing person that she is so committed to this dog and she says you know he's, he's a, a once in a lifetime dog um, and not very many people can you know have a dog with osteosarcoma and be three and a half years out and have a dog running at that level especially after having ribs removed so you know there is hope out there. I think sometimes we get, um, it's too easy to look at the, we're going to lose them all, you know, and, and I, I know that you lost uh, Sky not that long ago, and uh, one of my little ones, actually a couple of them I've lost to cancer, and it, it's a pretty horrible disease, um, but every once in a while we get somebody who really defies the odds, and it's just it's so cool when they do. <laughs> but I don't do much with agility dogs. <laughs> you know, there's so much to learn, and I think that what we need to do is to kind of unite our forces and, and do more research in areas that may not necessarily be, in quotes, profitable, right? Because medicine has become business, which I think is the really wrong way to approach it. Uh, medicine, medical research should be done by independent bodies that don't have any business interests in. And we all should be chipping in the funds for this research, as opposed to even donating money sometimes to different organizations, you realize that then a pharmaceutical company or medical development company takes this money and they do research that is self-serving. There are so many issues around why medicine has actually not progressed as much as it could because sometimes the simple treatments are actually the most effective treatments and the least expensive and the least licensable treatments are the most effective, right? So we need to really look at medicine as a field that it should be just removed from business and I would just say it should be all non-profit because if treating disease is business then there is something wrong with it right and I'm I, I'm kind of I don't really know what the solution is because when you look at the veterinary model veterinarians obviously need to pay for the equipment and the facilities and their education but I do think that we should refocus and start actually trying to make business models that are based on creating health as opposed to and being rewarded by creating health as opposed to treating disease. And that's, that's my dream and that's what I've been kind of trying to do for the last 10 years. First six years was on the verge of bankruptcy because it was very difficult and then people started to realize that we have something to offer and we just kind of figured it out and uh, it's been working but it, it, it's interesting, isn't it? What do you think? Well, uh, I, I think it's a huge problem. I think that uh, our medical system, you know, traditional Western medicine, is very good at chasing. We're we're too focused on treating disease instead of preventing disease. We're we're very good at you know we're kind of the ambulance chasers. It's like, oh look, he's falling apart. Oh look, he fell apart. Oh, we should probably try to put him back together instead of, hey look, we can keep him healthy. We can feed him good food and we can use good you know supplements or vitamins or whatever it is. You know, but let's get the foundation right. You know, the 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 pillars of health, the food, the exercise. You know, the clean environment. You know, not putting artificial chemicals in that are unnecessary. And I think if we would focus more on that part of health. I think things would be so much better. So my health insurance, the new plan that I had to go to a couple of years ago when the traditional one stopped uh, being affordable, this plan, the one thing I like about it is that every year I get a free physical exam and lab work because they want to be proactive. That's so unheard of. You know, everybody is so into closing the barn door after the horse already left when it comes to medicine. And I think that 
reactive medicine instead of proactive medicine has become the norm and that's what people expect. And I, I think that people think it's normal for their pets to have all these chronic diseases and it's, they expect that it's normal for the old dogs to have arthritis and the old dogs to have digestive problems and the old dogs and cats to develop diabetes and Cushing's disease and cancer. You know, we've come to accept that as the norm instead of saying, wait a minute, why is this happening and why don't we instead have 15 and 20 year old animals in good health? And I, I think we just need to switch the way that we look at things and come back at it from a, a different perspective. And there was an interesting um, research study, veterinarian, I think she's in Denmark, uh, did a raw feeding study and actually set it up like you would do the AFCO feeding trials, except she used the FEDIAC, which is the European uh, model, and basically set up feeding trials with dogs in raw feeding groups and published the results of their health their blood parameters, uh, their body parameters, and really measured everything. And I just got the email today, and I haven't even had a chance to sift through it. But I'm pretty excited that she, you know, did all of this work to actually show what the health of the raw feeding dogs can be. So in in my last book, The Yin and Yang Nutrition for Dogs, one of the things that we put in there is we had this cereal box made, and it's you know called human kibble and it's 100% complete and balanced and so it's basically you know dry cereal with all the vitamins and minerals added to make it a 100% complete and balanced diet it has all the vitamins and minerals that you need for your entire day so sit your child down and pour his bowl of kibble and give him a spoon and tell him to eat that for breakfast and dinner and uh, he'll, that's all you ever need to do and you your child will grow up to be this amazing person who you know has just incredibly good health because he ate that same complete and balanced diet every single meal. That sounds preposterous, yet that is exactly what we have been doing to our pets when we put dry kibble in that bowl and we expect our dogs and our cats to eat the same exact thing every meal. And it makes absolutely no sense. So why is it that the veterinary profession sells dry kibble, propagates this myth that our pets should eat that dry kibble all day, every day, and that's all that they ever need and that will promote good health. Human doctors don't do that. Why do veterinarians do that? Peter, I think that's a, a great analogy. Yeah, I, I, you know, he, he kind of left me speechless a little bit because uh, there is so much. And I also want, want to make sure that, that it doesn't come across as I'm speaking against my colleagues. But we have to really follow the money, right? And see how this whole processed food drama, I'm just going to call it, came up. And why there is such this resonance now between dog lovers who are actually straightforward thinking and using their common sense, thinking... Kibble does not make sense because I know no medical doctor that proposes that processed food is better than wholesome food. So when we look at the veterinary medicine, veterinary medicine kind of system, we are very good students. We vets obviously have to study hard to get our degree and uh, we also learn very quickly that if we disagree with something, we fail. So at school, if we don't follow a certain protocol, you fail. If you follow a certain protocol in a practice and it is not acknowledged conventional protocol, you can actually be punished for not following the conventional protocol. So the first issue is education and pet food companies educate veterinarians about diet. But you know, in, in Czech, I'm originally from the Czech Republic, we say this is like making goat the gardener, right? <laughs> they just, uh, their interest is to sell more, more kibble. Their interest is not to educate us about what what is actually healthy for our patients. And so because human doctors never suggest processed food for treating disease or as part, part of dietary plan, the same should apply in veterinary medicine. And if any of my colleagues actually want to have a healthy, friendly conversation, we can do that. I will try to see your points and I will present mine. 
As I'm talking here, I do not have any connection with any pet food companies. I do not make any money from saying what I'm saying and never have. I did not sell processed pet food in my practice when I had my clinic because I just simply didn't believe that that's the solution. Strangely enough, I was brought to this kind of era of raw diet feeding and cooked diet feeding by a dog lover who didn't have a veterinary degree and one day we were actually skiing up in Whistler. I used to work uh, as a vet in Whistler, BC in the ski resort and uh, I was telling her about a dog that had ear problems that the surgeon suggested that this dog's ears will be removed, uh, surgical ablation of the ear canal because you know it had chronic ear problems and nothing worked. And my friend looks at me, and I remember that very clearly. She looks at me and she says, why don't you just try raw diet? I go, are you kidding me? Like raw diet, that's dangerous. <laughs> and then as we kind of were finishing the ride on the lift, I'm thinking, wait a minute, like our dog sound, like when I was a child, like we used to feed her raw meat, right? And she was healthy and she was well. So by the time we finished the run, I, was, I decided that I'm going to call my client and say, you know, we have to switch your dog to raw food. And within two weeks, the ears were 50% better. And within two months, they were 100%. And you can't really not to see these, right? And, and then because we promised that we will never harm patients and we will always work in their interest and what is best for them, then you have no other choice than actually using what works well. And this is, I think, that the, the karmic kind of discrepancy of veterinary medicine, that the business model was very much built on selling drugs and processed food and services when there is disease. But we really have to soul search. And as you said, we have to see if we would feed kibble to our kids. If we don't, we should not be feeding it to our furry kids because they're as loved and as precious as human kids, right? I actually don't make any difference between human kids and animal kids because, you know, they're just our loves, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's no difference between, uh, you know, human kids and animal kids as far as how much we love them. And it's kind of one of those little oxymorons, like there's no such thing as people food. There's just food. And there shouldn't be people food and we can't even call it pet food because in America it's pet feed because it's not even classified as something that is edible by humans. And so that makes no sense that, you know, we should be feeding them something that we we're not even allowed to call it pet food. It has to be called pet feed as an animal feed because we know that the quality is so much lower in most of the processed products because that's where we're throwing all the waste products from the human food industry. So, you know, and as we're talking about the differences between the human medical field and the veterinary medical field, whoever came up with the idea that we should vaccinate these poor animals every single year, thank goodness we're starting to back off on that, but many veterinarians are, are still pushing annual vaccinations. But we never would have considered vaccinating our children every year until they reached 18 or even as adults. Whoever came up with this ludicrous idea for pets? <laughs> like there was no science behind it that said, hey, we should vaccinate them every year. I guess I, I would have to go back and read the history to figure out where this ever started and why. <laughs> yeah, you know, Thoughts? well, we have kind of become the obedient soldiers of uh, whatever industry it is, right? And they have been smart enough. And I'm just going to say as a professional, we have been stupid, stupid to actually believe what they were saying, right? And now it's just so much embedded in the system that it's really hard for us to exit. And some people have practice loans and uh, student loans and financially it is even maybe they believe that it would be good to stop selling processed food, but they just can't simply do it. And I think that we really have to restructure the medical model and, and see what we can do. The other thing is that, you know, the, the idea of 100% balanced food. What is 100% balanced food? Like, is it actually an achievable goal for you to know that your dog is not missing one single nutrient, 100% balanced food? In nature, dogs would roam and they would get variety of nutrients and herbs and, uh, and plants and um, meat and they would hunt the rabbits and deer and fowl. But nature doesn't really do the 100% balance. What it does is smorgasbord of nutrients. So offering a wide variety of nutrients 
will result in balanced diet. Now, we have messed it up a little bit again by overusing and abusing soils in different areas. I'll give you an example. If you grow um, kale in one field and then you take the kale away to another location and sell it in the store, the compost from the kale and also the number two, the, 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 the feces, do not go back to where, where the kale came from or tomatoes from California or whatever it is. So we've been transporting nutrients from one location to another and never, never get back. So we have interrupted the cycle of nutrients. So people who say, if I feed wholesome food, it's going to be enough for my dog. I'll say it is not because we have totally interrupted the food chain and we do have to supplement food because of that. But when it comes to kibble and making it 100% by pouring chemical vitamins in it and nutrients that are not really whole food, that's another issue. There's a difference between vitamins and supplements that are chemically made or the ones that are fermented or created as whole food. So people need to kind of start learning about how to supplement food properly and how not to trust everything that they read on a pet food label or everything that they get in a bottle of supplements. So it's, it's a huge issue and this is what I'm passionate about. And I believe that two thirds of medical conditions could be prevented by detoxing the body, providing the right food, the right supplements, aligning the spine, making sure that there is right exercise and low stress. I would agree with all of that because it is true. You know, it's uh, interesting. I was uh, speaking with Susan Thixton from Truth About Pet Food earlier today, and yeah, we were kind of discussing a similar topic about, you know, do they even test the food? So, you know, a pet food company makes a canned food, a kibbled food or whatever. Do they test it at the end of the process? for all the different vitamin and mineral levels that are supposed to be in there. And is it the same between every single batch? And can they guarantee that it's got, you know, this many units of vitamin D and this many units of vitamin E and this many, you know, parts per billion of boron or whatever? And no, that is not done. So nobody knows. And it's not consistent from batch to batch. It can't be the same unless you're testing all of the raw ingredients that are also going into it each and every time. To say that a food is 100% complete and balanced meets the AFCO standards or whatever standards you're following is a little bit of a, a falsehood because nobody really tests it and we, you know, we can't say that with 100% certainty about every single thing that comes out of a, a bag, box, or can. Uh, you know, if there was testing going on, we might find the pentobarbital in there before the animals get sick from eating the pentobarbital. Yeah. You know, th there is the, the other part is that, and I love this comparison that you just mentioned. I, I think that there is another issue that even if, if let's say, you try to figure out all the different ingredients in the food, and if, if they really measured it, which they don't, but you know, they, they list them on the label. They don't measure it often, and there is oxidization, there is, there is transportation, there is different temperatures, all that affects the nutrients. But then there is the dog, the, the, the dog that eats the food. It can be exercising more, exercising less. There is never, we can never determine what the ideal, optimal, amount is we can actually get a range but we can never say you know this dog needs 100 milligrams of this vitamin it, it is very very true and i hate to say it but we are out of time uh peter thank you very much for this phenomenal interesting conversation today i'm going to have you back on the show soon uh so that we can continue our conversation because i think there is so much that uh, we have to teach our listeners. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets on DreamVision7Radio.com. 